you think about the scale of those Anglo-Islamic exchanges, it finds its way into the Elizabethan stage. So between 1579 and 1624, there are no less than 62 plays with Islamic characters, themes, or settings. 62 plays. That's a lot of plays. Tim will tell you that's a lot of plays within this period. You've got Marlowe's Tamburlaine. Marlowe's Tamburlaine burns the Quran on stage. Okay? Infamous occasion a few years ago when it was staged in London and that scene was cut because of the obvious sensitivities of burning the Quran on stage. So, you know, these issues are very, very difficult to be talking about, of course, within our present historical moment. You've got Marlowe's play, The Jew of Malta, again, showing, showing Turks, kids' Spanish tragedy, and then a whole host of other minor Shakespearean playwrights. That phenomenon of putting the Turk, the Moor, the Muslim figure on stage reaches its zenith in the 1590s, when over 20 plays feature Turks and Moors. So what's interesting is that when Shakespeare first puts a Moor on stage, He's following fashions. He's basically picking up on this vogue for representing Muslim characters. And this is one of the first drawings that we have of a Shakespearean production. And this is Titus Andronicus. And it shows Titus in the middle, and it shows the Queen Tamora, Queen of the Goths on the right. But the thing I'm interested in is the figure on the far right. And this is Aaron, Aaron the Blackamoor, the agent of all that's evil and wrong and destructive in the play of Titus Andronicus. And you see him marked there very clearly through his color, because he's a blackamoor. He's a black Moorish character. And there we have him. And of course, Shakespeare, following fashion, is not at this point talking about Turks. But then he does go on and talk about Turks in the history plays. So these are just some extracts from the history plays from the Henriad. I'm not going to go through them because it's too... But endlessly you get these references to the figure of the Turk. And my point about this is that I want to suggest to you is that Henry V, Prince Hal, is to some extent associated with Islamic Turkishness. There's an extraordinary moment at the end of Henry IV Part II where Henry takes over as the King Henry and his brothers come in and his brothers are trembling because they think that he's going to kill them. Because, of course, the Ottoman practice is that when you become sultan, to avoid any political issues of succession, you have all your brothers strangled. The English know about this, and Henry V, Shakespeare has Henry V say, don't worry, I'm not going to be like a Turkish sultan even by saying I'm not going to be a Turkish sultan suggests that he has some association with Turkishness and he says brothers you mix your sadness with some fear this is the English not the Turkish court not Amarath which is an Englishism for Murad not Murad and Amarath succeeds I'm not like Murad I won't be like that I'm not going to kill your brothers I am instead ha but Harry Harry so Harry is succeeding Harry. I have succeeded my father, Henry IV. I am now Henry V. But weirdly, the association is there that somehow, perhaps Henry has this sort of Turkish tyranny within him. Now, you'll probably remember at the end of Henry V, he suddenly again turns back to talking about Turks. And at the very end, he says, he says to Catherine, he's married the French prince, Catherine, and he says, right, you and I are going to have kids and we're going to go on a massive pilgrimage and we're going to go, go on a crusade. We're going to go on a crusade against the Turks. And he says to her, shall not thou and I, why don't you and I, between Saint Denis, the French saint, and Saint George, the English saint, compound a boy? Should we not give birth to a young boy that will be produced from our French-English loins? half French, half English, that shall go to Constantinople and take the Turks by the beard. So at the end, it's as though Henry V has somehow expelled all these Turkish Islamic vices that the period 
thinks that he's involved with. But of course, what actually happens is that Henry VI comes along and actually destroys it all. Now then you've got Merchant of Venice, and some of you are thinking Merchant of Venice also has a character called Morocco. And Morocco in the Merchant of Venice tries to woo Portia, and he's seen as a very noble figure, and he's seen as a tawny moor, he's seen as a white moor. So you've then got Shakespeare playing around with these issues of moors and Turks, Turks and moors. So keep hold of the idea you've got Aaron, the black moor, then you've got Morocco from Merchant of Venice, the tawny moor. Then you've got Henry V being called something a bit like a sort of Turkish figure. What I'm interested in is that then in 1600, um, there's another play which Shakespeare writes that's a bit like Henry V, where there's another warrior who's also of suspect allegiance. Nobody really knows who he is, where he's come from. He's also better at fighting than wooing women. He's asked to defeat an overwhelming enemy against all odds. And throughout the play, he's going to be pushed to the limits of his emotional and physical endurance, just like Henry V. We call him Othello, right? Actually, there's an extraordinary way in which Henry V is very, very similar to Othello. And Shakespeare starts writing that play in 1600. He writes that play in 1600 just as this man is in London. This is the Moroccan ambassador who comes in late 1600 as part of a diplomatic delegation to have a commercial and political alliance between England and Morocco against Spain. And this is Abd al-Wahid bin Masood bin Muhammad al-Anuri. There he is. His portrait is painted by an, an anonymous English portrait painter. This man is important. This man is not an Orientalist fantasy. He's very real. And I love the way in which that portrait has captured the power of this man. He holds your gaze. He looks back at you. His turban is very interesting, and I'm going to talk about the turban in a minute. But can you see where I might be going about talking about a turban Turk called Othello? This guy sits around in London for six months. He has a whole retinue. The English talk about him, sometimes in denigratory terms, sometimes in great admiration of him. They say that some of his delegation die and are buried. They die of natural causes, and they're buried somewhere in London. They say it's very weird because they, they, they kill their livestock in different ways to us. They're sort of trying to understand these Islamic practices that they can't really understand. He leaves in later 1600, and that's when Othello is written by Shakespeare. So my point is, I want, to, I want you to think about Othello, not as we often do, the black North African or African-American figure who's brought down by the scheming white man, as somebody much more complex, like this guy, al Onuri. And what's interesting about him is that we believe that based on what we can see of this portrait is that al Onuri was actually a Morisco. He was actually a Spanish-born Muslim who'd been forcibly converted to Christianity and then had reconverted to Islam and was now coming as part of the Moroccan Islamic Empire. A man who switched sides, who's been a Muslim and then a Christian and then a Muslim again. This is sounding like a figure that we call a fellow, okay? a figure that we don't really understand. And we don't really understand because we can see here, yes we can. Now, um, a description, when people always say to me, who is a fellow? Is he black, is he white, is he a Christian, is he a Muslim? And I say, Shakespeare deliberately does not tell you who he is for very, very specific reasons. And there's a moment where he's being asked to account for himself. He's married Desdemona, and he has to go in front of the Venetian Senate. And they say, you've got to account for why you've married Desdemona. And he comes out with this speech, which we all go to to understand the origins of Othello. He says, well, he says, Desdemona's father, her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life. He invited me to his house. He asked me about all the things I'd done throughout my history as a military man. From year to year, the battles, sieges, and fortunes that I have passed, I ran it through. I told him everything, even from my boyish days. 
to the very moment that he bade me tell it, wherein I spake of most disastrous chances. I told him about all the disasters I'd been through, of moving accidents by flood and field, in, in rivers, throughout fields, in these extraordinary campaigns, of hairbreadth escapes in the imminent deadly breach. And this is the important bit of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence and portents in my traveler's history. What is he telling us? Who is the insolent foe? Is the insolent foe the Turks? So if we assume that he was born a Muslim from Mauritania, that means that he sold into slavery, probably in the Mediterranean galleys, and then redeem that word redemption, which has a very Christian sense of redemption, um, that he's redeemed by Christians. But if he's from Mauritania, he's just as likely um, to be non-Muslim, okay? Because this is a period, of course, where Islam is in North Africa, but some of the Mauritanian communities are, have not converted at this point. So my point about this speech is that Shakespeare deliberately, deliciously, provocatively leaves his origins open. And he's rather like al -Anuri. He's a figure that you're not really sure of who he is. Is he a convert? Is he a revert? Is he a Christian? Is he a Muslim? Is he a pagan? What kind of figure is he? And this rolls on through the play. Desdemona, a figure that we never really think of in this way, Desdemona later in the play has this extraordinary speech called the Willow Song speech. And what's interesting is that she compares herself to a serving maid that her mother had. And she knows she's going to be killed by Othello. And so she sings this incredibly tragic song of Willow. And she describes it. She says, my mother had a maid called Barbary. This absolutely means that the elite Venetian mother had a serving woman called Barbary. Barbary from North Africa, a Muslim serving woman. My mother had a maid called Barbary, she remembers. And she was in love. And he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow. So this forsaken Barbary maid has this song that she sings. It's an old thing, an old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. I have much to do but to go hang my head all at one side and sing it like poor Barbary. Tony Morrison has written this extraordinary short play called Desdemona, and I interviewed her last year at, at Hay, which is one of the reasons I'm here at Jaipur, because Willie was trying to, to get Tony Morrison to come out, and I said, oh, I'll come. <laughs> um, and Tony Morrison's short play talks about her by saying she becomes, at this point, Desdemona metaphorically becomes the Barbary maid. She becomes the Muslim serving woman in this kind of extraordinary moment. And I'm interested in what Tim will say about this because there's a way in which this scene is usually played about her desperate innocence. And it's just this sort of tragic moment when she realizes that she's going to be killed. But at this moment, she takes on the persona of the Barbary maid, the Muslim serving woman. So you've got this extraordinary sort of ambivalence, this conflation of characters suddenly taking on the role of Muslim figures. And I think that that's coming out of these weird, contradictory, ambivalent alliances and unclear connections between Protestantism and Islam. And we get it right at the end of the play. This extraordinary moment at the end of the play where Othello has his death speech. He's killed Desdemona. And he stands up and he says, I want you to tell my story. Tell the story of what's happened to me. And you've only got a bit of it here, um, but I want to, I'll just do the end. He says, set you down this. So he's addressing all the Venetians who are horrified. They see Desdemona lying there, strangled. All these bodies are lying there. And he says, look, he's just about to kill himself. He has a knife. And he says, tell my story. Fellow great storyteller, I've just shown you a bit earlier, which is about his traveler's history, the stories he's going to tell. He says, tell another story. Tell a story of what happened to me. Set it down like this. Set you down this. Get a pen and get ready to write it. Say besides that in Aleppo once, Shakespeare talking about Aleppo, and I taught this play for 20 years 
And I used to say to a room like this of undergraduate students, where is Aleppo? And for nearly 20 years, not a single person knew where Aleppo was. We all now know where Aleppo is. So of course, the Elizabethans knew it as a trading center, but again, it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end that here we are in a fellow telling a story about Aleppo. And he says, say besides that in Aleppo once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state. So he says, there was this malignant and turbaned Turk, this Muslim, who grabbed a Venetian and he beat the Venetian and he was rude about the Venetian state. He says, what happened is that I took by the throat the circumcised dog, the Turk, and I smote him thus. And at that point, he stabs himself. It's the most phenomenal moment, death scene, I think, in all of Shakespeare. It's this tragic moment of self-division because he's saying, I'm the loyal Venetian servant. I stabbed the Turk. But at the same time, he's becoming the Turk. Yeah? He's taking on that role. He's becoming the more Turk Christian, all kind of together. And of course, in criticism, what we know is that you have, to make, you have to decide one way or the other. Is this him being the loyal Venetian and trying to expel the Turk by stabbing himself? Or has he finally become the Turk? Now, any good dramatist knows that it's not one thing or the other. It's both at the same time. And that's what Shakespeare's doing really brilliantly. He's drawing on all these hopes, fears, anxieties, strange alliances with Islam to create this extraordinarily complicated figure. And he stabs himself. He kills himself. So it seems to me that, you know, this, this whole interest around Shakespeare and Islam culminates in Othello. He never really goes back to Islam. The Tempest is very interesting. You know, the Tempest is a play which is set in North Africa, and we're told repeatedly that Sycorax is from, you know, Prospero says, where's she from? Where's she from to Ariel? And he says, from Algeri Algiers, from Algeria. And he says, was she so? Where again? Algiers. Algiers. Tunis. This is a play which happens after a wedding of a Christian woman to a Muslim ruler in Tunis, Claribel. These weird echoes still keep coming up in later Shakespeare plays, but never as profoundly as this. So it seems to me that, you know, as we start to think about celebrating Shakespeare in 2016, 400 years since he died, let's not necessarily just champion him as the sort of gentle Shakespeare, the great sort of English icon, but as a much more worrying, difficult dramatist who is deliberately drawing on all these provocative, difficult questions of religion, of faith, of sectarian conflict, just the kind of thing that, is Bashar up here here? Just, the legend, just the kind of thing that he's been doing so brilliantly with Haggard's wonderful, wonderful new version of Hamlet, and of course, uh, Vishal Bashwat has also done a version of this with Othello. So let's try and think in 2016 of this kind of version of Othello, of Shakespeare. And that's really where I finish, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jerry. That is uh, fabulous. And it's like uh, I find this with Shakespeare, who is like an enormous mansion of possibility that through a whole life, someone comes along and just opens another cupboard into another truth that's in there that you hadn't noticed before. And that's, that's an extremely stimulating encounter for us with um, Shakespeare's connection with an understanding of the Islamic world, as we call it. So I think, do you want to sit down now? Jerry? I'm good. I'm a bit. Are you Ooh. good? Oh, you're yeah. up. You're up. Oh, my God. Yeah, no. We've got to watch it, guys and girls. Um, maybe I'll get up and sit down. No. Uh, so... Um, I'm going to just ask Jerry a couple of questions and then we'll have a, a good 15 minutes for questions from the floor. And the first question that struck me is about Othello, briefly. I don't want to get too technical in, partly because it's a play I don't really understand, so I'm going to be very vulnerable if we get too technical, but also because we've got to have time for the more general perspective. But I think that one of the things that we... Uh, we in a contemporary theatre world, and perhaps film world as well, one of the ways in which we're quite reductive about Othello 
is in making it mainly about the issue of racial politics and colour, because that's the thing that's most live for us. For me, this is a danger, although it's a good danger, it's an exciting danger. It's a danger of the school of thought that says we must make Shakespeare very relevant to our audiences now, otherwise we won't enjoy it. Now, of course it's true. If it's not relevant, it's irrelevant, and no one wants that. But by making it relevant, we often talk about narrowing down the lens of the play so that it strikes a clear accord with our concerns. Now, that's okay, but it's reductive because a lot of what you were talking about is actually a more complex issue with Othello that he is, if not himself a Muslim, because he might be a practicing Christian, for sure, as you said, but he's from the Islamic world and his story within that world, and his relationship to his Christian allies is extremely complex and fraught, not just with questions of color that, uh, um, that Iago talks about, but questions of religion, culture, background, and the outsider status. Because there's the whole thing about the handkerchief, yes, and the relationship with magic yeah. of the handkerchief, mm -hmm. and therefore, True or not, the relationship in Shakespeare's mind between a Moorish background and a connection with a certain kind of magical belief. Okay, so there's all of that area. Do you think I'm right that, there, that, that, that we tend to narrow it into the racial color politics? Yeah. Yeah. And do you think, do you agree with me that that's a reductive process to get stuck in? Com completely, because you know, I mean, one of the things there's a sort of liberal response, which we all used to do in the sort of 80s and probably still into the 90s, where we'd say, poor Othello, he's this poor, done-down black guy who's destroyed by the white guy. Isn't it terrible? So we must now teach that and say we feel very sorry for Othello. Now, that works within a sort of, well, actually a pre-apartheid, you know, civil rights, African-American tradition. That was a very important moment to sort of address the question of racism. What I'm suggesting is that that, that is clearly anachronistic within its historical moment because those issues of race were not really applicable. Yeah. Now, Shakespeare's, again, he's playing with it. Shakespeare's always needling you. So, of course, in those first scenes, you have the comments about him being a black ram tupping the white ewe. And they are very, they're very racially charged. But we've magnified that, as you say. We've sort of taken that up, because on the liberal left, we wanted to challenge that and say, no, we mustn't have that. You know, we mustn't be colorblind. You know, as famously Col Coleridge said, it's a great play. Othello can't be black because it's a great play, he must be white, really. Huh? And then you had, of course, famously, Laurence Olivier, blacked up in, in the most embarrassing, embarrassing way. Um, and so you try and, and, and Olivier wanted to try and get beyond that. So there's a way in which it, it was, there's an important political moment to say, let's challenge, let's use the play to challenge questions of race. And you know, um, apartheid productions, you know, Janet Sussman, incredibly powerful. So at that moment, that was very significant, but it seems to me now, of course, through an alchemy of our current historical moment, okay, post 9-11, post 7-7, when you're dealing with these issues, the play suddenly changes again. Because the reductiveness will never let you hold it at a point about discussing race. And suddenly, and I did this, I mean, I was writing on East-West Cultural Exchange around the time of 9-11, and it, it spooked me so much to then see different elements of the play that we just hadn't picked up on. Yeah. So the player is, well, it's like the Aleppo well, moment. I, I, so it's a yeah. layered play. Yeah. So the point is, again, that now it resonates in a way. You said something really interesting at the beginning. You said, you know, it's not a play that you know, you're uncomfortable with. It's a play that I think we still don't understand. Mm. In our current moment, we suddenly go, whoa, this is the play which is very, very profound for us. Everybody is now performing Othello. And I don't think that we still quite understand the way in which it's playing games with what we see as re race, questions about theology, questions of sectarianism, and Shakespeare is deliberately doing that. Shakespeare is not interested in the history, right? You know, many of us in Shakespeare studies for sort of 25 years practiced something called new historicism, where we just found a bit of history and we said, oh, look, that history is good, we should read King Lear again soon. Right? Shakespeare was not interested in the history. He, my argument is he knew about the history and he's taking that to produce something dramatically powerful. He's not interested in trade, he's not interested in merchants in Morocco, but he is interested in the ambivalence, the ambivalence that a figure like, like a figure like Al Anuri, all these characters, is my power. And by the way, I'm showing these images, you know, this is an Albrecht Dürer image of a Barbary serving woman. 
from the early 16th century in Venice. This is an extraordinary figure. We don't know who this guy is on the right is. We date this to uh, Antwerp in the 1520s. He's an ambassador. Nobody knows who or what he is. But then you look at Al Anuri, and my point is that this guy is both somebody that you think might be an ally, and he might be a deep threat. Mm. And that's precisely where Shakespeare, I think, is putting Othello. He's not trying to pin him down, because he's told you. What are his origins? I'm not going to tell you what his origins are. Mm. I'm going to let all those anxieties kind of creep into the audience. And that's what he's done with Othello. I, I, think, so I think that's extremely lucid and, and really a very important uh, point to just clarify before we turn it out to the audience, is that that means that this is a remarkable time to uh, produce or share Othello as a story about an absolutely um, um, mystified mutual relationship of misunderstanding. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. that's the yeah. that's the, um, yeah. the the terrifying politics of our moment. And Othello, I would love to see a production of Othello that does that. And to do that, I would really have to see an Othello who really does come from that world. And that's yeah. what we've we've yeah. underexplored, yeah. I guess. You know, you saw the response to that and you've put that beautifully, which is really my point. That every time I say to people I'm working on Shakespeare in Islam, they say, Where's Shakespeare in Islam? Where's he going? That's not the point. The point is just of that mutual misunderstanding and misrecognition. That's what we're seeing going on. You know, I'm not saying Queen Elizabeth is sitting there writing to the so o Ottoman Sultan saying, I think he's a really nice guy and we could probably go to church together. She's not doing that. She's saying there's an interesting moment of real politic where I can see a strategic alliance, but another moment I'm going to turn around and stab that guy in the back. Okay? And that's the, the, the mutual suspicion, weird sort of dance that's going on. And that's what the play's captured. And yeah. you know, Adrian, Adrian Lester recently uh, played this at the, at, the, at the National. And again, Adrian Lester, fantastic actor. But again, what you have is you know, a very clearly ethnically black actor playing Othello. And they have this weird bit that they tried to basically set it in an army camp that a muezzin sort of appears and you think we're weirdly in Afghanistan. And they're, they're sort of reaching, they're feeling for something that's slightly different. But again, we want to say we need the classical black English actor. But Adrian Lester said something very interesting. He said, the play is not finished. He said, it's all about the gaps that Shakespeare leaves, particularly around that dynamic between Othello and Iago, which of course I haven't talked about. Um, so it's about that openness that Sha and the ambivalence that Shakespeare's left there. Let's not try and pin the Shakespearean thing down. And yeah. I haven't mentioned Iago. And one thing to say about Iago, which we always tend to forget, is that the name Othello is brought down by a man called Iago. Iago, of course, is the Spanish for James. His name is Santiago. Are there any Spaniards? <laughs> Are there any Spaniards here? Do you know Santiago? Who is Santiago? Any Spaniard will say to you, oh, Santiago, he's the slayer of the Moor. Iago is the slayer of the Moor. Mm. That's what his role is. So again, it's Shakespeare introducing that Spanish Catholic, Catholic dimension of terrible sectarian conflict. And that's what Iago's role is. And it's extraordinary to do that, to name him as such. James I has just come to, the th has come to the throne within a couple of years. I mean, that's a dangerous thing to be giving your character a name called James, yeah. the, ultimate, the ultimate evil character. Let me just stop you. Sorry, Jerry. It's fantastic and fascinating, but I do want time for audience, mm. and we're in that last 15 minutes where questions have got to come. Yes, you at the front. Are we, do we, can we do it without yeah, mics on. in here, or should Pro we do mics? I think we need mics. mics. So can okay, hear. here's a mic down at the front, yep, and a uh, question. I, I've watched other mediators uh, say to the audience, can you keep your questions short and please do ask a question. Uh, I'm going to say that too, but I'm really going to make you ask a question. You can make a statement and then ask a question as long as it's brief, but not a big speech, please. Yes. Well, firstly, thank you so much. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, I was really interested to hear about the Quran in circulation in that part of London at that time. And I wanted to sort of find out a bit more about that and also about the textual history of Othello, whether there are any sources that Shakespeare was using, whether this Othello story appears in any Islamic okay, story. Okay, fantastic. Sure. That's really clear. So try, try and keep it brief, Jerry, okay. can, so we have time for more. Uh, uh, Quran in circulation and source of Shakespeare. The Quran is first translated in a very mangled version into English in 1649 by a guy called Ross, and he's getting it from the French text, which is in circulation earlier. Marlowe, it seems to me, so you know, people go on about this, you know, Marlowe knows clearly much more about Islamic faith and belief, but he is burning 
the Quran in, in, uh, in the late 1580s with Tamburlaine. So we know that the text is in, in circulation in Latin versions and in French versions. Now, of course, I, I suspect that Marlowe, being much more educated than Shakespeare, um, Shakespeare having not very much Greek, uh, not having much Latin and even less Greek, as we know, and certainly didn't have Arabic. Um, but, of course, the text is being translated because Catholicism particularly thinks it needs to know thy enemy, so it needs to have a text of the Quran. Um, it's a very bad translation, um, which basically <laughs> misrecognizes again, because it, it actually, in the translation, what Christian commentators do is say the religion is, is terrible and misguided, it's actually in the Quran, so deliberate mistranslation. But yeah, so that's, that's in circulation. Um, and the other point was, was, was source of the Othello material. The source of, Where does yeah. the story so, come from? So mostly, of course, we get it from uh, Italian, Italian uh, novella. So there are various ways in which you say, this is from Cynthia, this is an obvious text, and the story is there. Again, that seems to me interesting because, of course, there's a whole other moment which I've written about before about the way in which the Italian Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance court are also corresponding and working with the Turks at various moments. So it seems to me that those texts have come to Shakespeare uh, through Italy, but also through a, a kind of contested exchange between Italy and the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, great, thank you. Sorry? I don't, no, I don't believe, uh, no, it's, yeah, I don't, well, I don't get that at let's, all. Let's but then Gil, Gil doesn't think there's any representation of Islam in Shakespeare, so we'll, uh, we'll agree to disagree. Well, <laughs> we, can, we can make that debate next year. Yes, in the front, please. Um, would a contemporizing of Othello be set against the Turkish entry into the European Union? <laughs> That's great. Well, um, <laughs> You know, I mean, um, Jerry mentioned a, a recent production at the National which was famous for its utter contemporization, meaning it was set in the British Army now on, um, on uh, what's the word, in service in, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, it, you know, it doesn't matter. The, the, the thing that Jerry took slight objection to, which I did too on a conceptual level, was following the politics of Britain, uh, Othello became a, a product of a the black British um, population, rather than an outsider culturally. He was very much a British uh, born, no, it was very, very good production in so many ways. But it meant that the complexity of its, um, of its military situation wasn't really pertinent, mm. if you see what I mean, because yeah. the character wasn't really torn mm. in that situation, mm. if you see what I mean, mm. that, that, that's yeah. all. But can I ask, uh, in answer to, I mean, I know it's slightly funny in a way, but, you know, again, it goes back to my argument about the Ottoman Empire. You know, if you, if you look at uh, an artist like Bellini, Bellini, who's in uh, Constantinople in 1453, um, painting Mehmet the Conqueror, and we still have those portraits. Now, in Istanbul, they say, that's our, that's our connection to the Renaissance, right? So I think, actually, the, the EU question is, is of course, very, is very troubling. But my view is, of course, in that period, they are absolutely seen as part of Europe. And to actually keep them out of the EU, I think, is a terrible denigration of that sort of shared history. Well, it's causing it, a further problem. And just to throw into this, by the way, if anybody hasn't, Jerry's referred once or twice to a writer called Marlowe and a play called Tamburlaine the Great, which, if you don't know it, of whatever age you are, I really recommend you read it because it's less subtle than Othello, but my God, it's more shocking. And it's a stunning portrayal of the Turkish emperor who in the end is caged in a, is, is put in a cage, stripped naked and burst his brains out. And not by a Christian, he's, he, he's, he's put in a cage by Tamburlaine the, 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 the conqueror. So um, it, 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 uh, Tamburlaine, Marlowe's work, really speaks, I think, more urgently to the atmosphere of our times and the terrors in the West about groups like ISIS that's Marlowe, yeah. but they're both important. So Othello's more meditative and complex. Mm. Marlowe is more shocking. What about Aurangzeb? Isn't there a play by Marlowe? Isn't Aurangzeb a ca another yeah, character in Tamburlaine? Yeah, she's in Tamburlaine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, m yeah. She's, she's Tamburlaine. He, he sort of enslaves her, but she becomes his girlfriend? Yeah. Or am I getting yeah. confused? Uh, yeah. But, but it's an interesting comment, and it goes back to the question of sources, because again, you know, 
in Anglo-American criticism, all we do is we basically look for the Latin tradition. We never look for any of the source material. So the question, Jonathan Gil Harris sort of saying, well, are there other sort of you know, long lost uh, Arabic connections? Yes, probably around commonality of stories, stories circulating, the you know, Arabian night stories which are in circulation. But we've just never looked for that. So Stephen Greenblatt, the great, the great American Shakespearean, knows about, huh? He's coming next year, right, ask him about Shakespeare and Islam because he's actually admitted to me, he said, because we came from the American Academy before 9-11, we never looked east. Our interest was always in the New World because mm. they wanted to find an American connection to Shakespeare, right? Mm. Um, and so their play has always been Tempest. The Americans have always fixated on said, the Tempest must be a play about America, and it's just nonsense. Uh, yeah. It's there, again, it's another layer, but it's also about Tunis, it's also about Carthage, it's also about Virgil, it's also about the Ottomans, you know? Shakespeare sets a play in the Mediterranean in 1611, when, as Willie Dalrymple knows, you know, the kind of, ex I mean, the Mediterranean is just a soup of basically exchange of galley slaves, converts, English pirates, and it doesn't touch the surface of Shakespeare. Well, I think it does, because you just get the eruption of these strange places that when you say Algiers in 1611, everybody knows that's about English converts and slaves turning Turk, shifting sides, either yeah. side of the religious divide. So, another question, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you, yes, sir, because we, yes, yes, I'm going to take this gentleman here as, as we... Um. Um, Hamlet famously says there's nothing either good or, good or bad, but thinking makes it so. How do you, how, when it comes to a character like Shylock um, and Shakespeare's humanization of a Jewish character, how do you compare that to how he does Othello, who's a potentially Muslim character? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and, and I think that's why Morocco becomes such an important figure. Because, you know, one way of saying is that they're both Semitic aliens, right? So Shylock the Jew and Morocco, the dismissed Muslim figure, right, are both these Semitic aliens. And so, again, of course, within the period, another conflation that goes on is that Christianity often sees Judaism and Islam as similarly deformed versions of a lost Abrahamic religion. So I think that that's partly what's going on. And that weird, weird moment in the play where, sorry for those of you who don't know it, but there's a servant called Lancelot Gobbo who's suddenly accused of getting the Barbary maid pregnant. And you go off into this weird scene about the Barbary maid being pregnant. And again, we've just lost what, that, what, what that's all about. But again, I think your point is, is there a basic humanity, that sort of humanist reading that, you know, in the end what happens with Shylock, he says, you know, D you know I'm just really like you. I think there's a darker version of it because, of course, at the end he says, the villainies you teach me, I will execute. So he says, I'm just going to do what you Christians have told me. I think it's a devastating, devastating 1594 critique of multiculturalism. Right? It's about him saying, it's great living in Venice when we're all making money and coining it, but as soon as anything goes wrong, you're after me, aren't you? Well, I'm just going to turn around and do the same to you. So I think we have to read Shylock. Yeah. You were saying something so interesting about King Lear, how we have to kind of keep, you know, two versions of King Lear going, the tragic, you know, the sort of lacrimose figure. And it's a similar thing with Shylock. If we simply just try to read him as the poor Jew who's been destroyed, I don't think that gets us any further and in a more interesting place. The poor Jew, it's just kind of, it's sort of liberal hand rigging Christianity, a poor little Jew. That's awful. I think that Shakespeare's giving you a much darker, more complex version saying, this is what Venice is like. Venice is like this. We can trade with them, and then they'll turn around and do you in, and we'll do the same to the Jews. So he creates this monster, but the, cr the monster's being created by Christianity, not because he's a Jewish merchant who's only interested in money. Thank you very much. Uh, you would there? Yes. Uh, I'm intrigued by this connection that you make. Sorry, could you just put the mic at your mouth? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by this connection that you make between Henry V and um, uh, Othello. And um, it's essential to remember that both of them are essentially soldiers yeah. and generals, and bo both of them are uh, extremely wily also. Yeah. So, and one is an Englishman, the other is a Moor. Yeah. And uh, do they then ambiguously uh, exchange places in the sense that when Shakespeare creates Othello, culturally he is a very white man, uh, though he is black in, in color. And uh, also the fact that maybe to lend exoticism to the romantic story, uh, Desdemona falls in love with a black man 
and it lovers blind and and all those issues yeah, come okay. up yeah, so, so would you like to comment yeah, on that yeah, quick comment on that it's, it's, it's a really yeah. good point and th there's a famous article by an american uh, literary critic called norman rabkin and he said we never know who henry the fifth is we don't know whether he's the great christian warrior or he's the despotic tyrannical figure and he says it's like that gestalt image of the duck and the rabbit yeah, duck, rabbit, rabbit, duck. You have the kind of basic drawing and you say, you look at one moment and you see a duck and at the other point you see a rabbit. And he says, he's both at the same time. He's duck, rabbit, rabbit, duck. And that's what a fellow is. Yeah. Hold on, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry. He, thre and he threatens violence and it's exactly the same thing. And I think you think of the last speech of a fellow, you have to remember, this is a, and, and uh, Toni Morrison got me to this, she said, and she's imagined it in these horrifying uh, parts of her, of her play, where she says, he's a boy soldier. He's been ripped from his community. All he knows is murder and rape. And, and Henry V, of course, is just the same. Yeah. And there's that weird moment where Henry says, if you don't let me into Harfleur, I will turn into a Herod figure, and I will just burn you and kill you and rape you all. And of course, okay. and yeah, exactly, because Herod, Herod is always shown in the medieval tradition as being a Mohammedan. Jerry, that's a fantastic way to, uh, fantastic way to finish. And um, I'm just going to thank you all very much for your attention and your focus. Thank, thank you. you. And um, just to say uh, that I'm looking forward enormously to Jerry's book, uh, Shakespeare and Islam, yeah, which will be out in a bookshop near you. Oh, no, they're not going to let you have the title. Well, well you'll, you'll know what it's about. Last thing to say, have a great day. And whatever, you can do anything you want with Shakespeare, but whatever you do, remember, he's there to open our minds, not close them. So don't narrow it down. Prize it open. Thank you very much and bless you. We wish to thank our speaker, Trot. It was a wonderful session. Thank you very much once again.